for me to feel guilty is not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. And guilt, for us to experience guilt, loads on empathy, meaning empathy as perspective taking. So if I do something to you, Jeff, that I think could be harmful or hurtful to you, if I experience guilt and it's loaded on empathy, what I do is I step outside and I step into your shoes, observing my behavior from your perspective. And I can say, hey, Jeff, when I did that, I can imagine that hurt you. Will you forgive me? It leads me back into relational repair when I have a relational rupture. Marcus Aurelius said, what we do in life echoes through eternity. What is your life echoing through eternity? Welcome to Echoes Through Eternity with Dr. Jeffrey Skinner. Our mission is to inspire, engage, and encourage leaders from across the globe to plant missional churches and be servant leaders. So join us and hear the stories of servant leaders reverberating lives as God echoes them through eternity. Brought to you by Missional Church Planting and Leadership Development in Dynamic Church Planting International. Welcome into Echoes Through Eternity. I am your host, Dr. Jeffrey D. Skinner. What is God echoing through your life today? I am joining my studio today by John Comstock, Reverend John Comstock. He is the director, I guess it is. The owner. He's not the owner of it, but he, he's certainly the, the main guy that if you need to get on to discipleshipplace.org, that's who you talk to. And you create an account there, you go to that place, and they have all kinds of content for discipleship, exactly what it says, discipleship.org. But it's not just about Bible stuff. I mean, they it is Bible contextually, but but it's mental health, it's, it's anxiety, it is uh, shame, it is addiction recovery. I mean, it is the gamut of all kinds of stuff out there. One of the best resources I know Certainly for the Church of Nazarene, but I would argue on the web, period, the myriad of resources that are out there. I was talking to him the other day, and I thought, you know, I need to get him on here. This is a well-kept secret. Not a lot of non-Nazarenes know about it, and so we want to spread that word. We want to get that word out about the discipleshipplace.org. Let John interview John. Let him talk a little bit about it, what his vision and mission was. He's been doing this for 18 years. We we're talking, my kids had not even been born when he started that, and some of his kids had not even been born. So, welcome, John. Great to have you, man. Yeah, thank you. It's good to be with you. Yes. Tell us a little bit about, I, I gave my perspective on discipleshipplace.org, but you being the director of it and have, doing it for 18 years, you could probably give a much better description of it. Sure, yeah. Well, the Discipleship Place is designed to be resourcing for the local church. And so we have all kinds of resourcing for individuals, depending on where their needs are. And we're working to expand and grow that. Everything we do is completely free. We don't charge for anything. And so it is free to anyone that will go and create an account. And there's no expectation that there be any kind of financial obligation on the part of anybody. It's our way of giving back to the local church. And so we have different courses there, anything from how to study the Bible, which is actually designed to be some some courses that were written by Dr. Jim Edlin, who's a now a retired professor from Mid-American Nazarene University. And he wrote that course for new believers really in mind. It was designed to, to be thinking about how to teach basic principles in Bible study, not reading the Bible devotionally, but studying scripture. So that's one of the things that we have on the discipleship side. We have Bible studies. We have courses that come from the modular course of study. And there's been several contributors to that work. People like Diane Lecker, as far as with the spiritual formation course that we have, and some of those that come from the clergy development side of things that were modified for laity. And then we have some video courses and conversations that we've recorded, things like Towards a Theology of Shame and Love that we've recorded with Reverend Roland Hearn out of Australia. And we just released one that we're calling Mental Health and Discipling Communities. And that was with Dr. Janet Dean, a psychologist and ordained elder in the Church of Nazarene. 
So there's a, a lot of different things there that are available and people can work through that at their own pace. And so we just make that available to to do at their convenience or with their church in a small group. So if they're not doing it in, as an individual, they can certainly do it that way as well. And we have a lot of people that do use it as a group kind of study in their discipleship communities. Christian leaders everywhere are talking about Revitalize to Plant. Written by Drs. Desmond Barrett and Jeffrey D. Skinner, Revitalize to Plant is more than a philosophical approach to church planting and revitalization. The authors have experienced the crucible of leading in the trenches of ministry. It's gritty, practical, and most of all, recasts our vision and understanding of church planting and revitalization. Revitalize to Plant, now available on Amazon or RevitalizedToPlant.com. That's RevitalizedToPlant.com, the last resource you'll need to bring new life to your church. Yeah, that that is one of the strengths of it. I think is that that um, the local church, and again, it is put out by the Church of Nazarene, but but I mean, it's biblical stuff. It is going to have a Wesleyan bent, Wesleyan bend towards theological content, just because we're Wesleyan. But the reality is, is as a lot of the folks that I talk to are Wesleyan, and even if they have a different brand. <laughs> <laughs> on their on their outside, when you start unpacking their theology, they they're more closely aligned with Wesley than do Calvin. But not many people like the idea that they have no choice in the matter as to whether they're going to go to heaven or hell. Like, well, I, I think I I have a say in that. <laughs> but anyway, there are there are some that just say, "Hey, you know, God decides, and I have no say in it." And for those people, we just we just say, "Okay." That's that's good. We love you, and just go on. But anyway, beyond that, it is it is good biblical content. It is good discipleship stuff for any denomination. So if you're a if you're a family, and that's one of the ways I've used it in the past is is pull it up on my TV. I mean, right now media cost a subscription to get access to their content. This is free. You can pull this stuff up and put it on your TV in the living room, stream it there, and and participate in a small group study with a family completely free of charge you know i love that talk a little bit about what your how it's changed over the years when you first started it 18 years ago and how it's evolved over the years well it's a good question when we first started it was really focused a lot and still does have this element to it in fact we have a couple of courses one for those who work with children and some that work with youth on best practices for those respective ministry areas. When we started, though, 18 years ago, it was really designed um, to try to equip people for specific local church ministries. And what we've done more and more is to establish more of a broad discipleship genre, if you will. So it's not necessarily about ministry-specific stuff, although we don't exclude that as an option. But we do want to try to work in more areas of equipping people in discipleship endeavors that are designed for everyday life. And so it's not just within the local church, but how do we strengthen and help people grow in a relationship with God on a daily basis? We are working on a new website. I do want to say that to Jeff. We have a website that hopefully will be released in June. It will be a brand new site, a completely new platform. And one of the things that we want to do in terms of where it's going to hopefully evolve will be that we will have more of a community element to the website. So right now it's, it is content driven primarily, although there is a, there is a community piece to it. But what we really want to do is more, more intentional about the community side of that with groups online. Good. And design content around the community element of the website. So that's one of the things that we're looking to change with this new rollout. Good. And so, yeah, that, that would be good. So kind of almost, I mean, not social media, but, but to kind of bring that element in there where people collaborate and discuss and that type of thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I really would like to see and it will be there in elements of what I'll call the new version 2.0 will be tools for the local church. And so what we want to do is not just provide a website for individuals, but really have the, the tool set for a pastor of a local church. So, for example, 
we want to be able to have the ability for pastors to kind of see on a dashboard what is going on in their local church and maybe even create customized plans for oh, yeah. individuals to kind of walk through, whether that be stuff on our site or maybe they have other things that they do <clears> for <throat> discipleship, but then kind of create that <laughs> discipleship platform that can be used administratively with pastors to run reports and kind of yeah. have insight and oversight into that process of their local church. Yeah, I could I could even see that, you know, a lot of the churches post COVID have maintained that online presence there. And so I could even see that taking their small groups in Sunday school, where you may have a small group that meets on a particular night, but you may have a few that can't you know, travel there so they could Absolutely. you know utilize something on discipleship place and you and then bring them in to that discussion there. So that would be that'd be really good. Will there be a video element to that or no? Well we are doing more and more videos and certainly video will be a large part of that. Some of our courses are available through audio as well. So you know lessons we realize not everyone likes to read. Some of the things that we yeah. have there are text heavy and dependent on reading. And we do have those where you could actually listen if you want. And so if you're on your drive into work and you want to yeah. listen to a lesson while you're doing that, a great way to actually access the resources. And some of that is available via text. So we can even send it through text messaging on a daily basis, some of those lessons. So we have yeah. several that are that way as well. And so there's there's more and more we're trying to do to create options for people to access because not everyone's the same. And there's different yeah. ways that people like to access content. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah, I, I can definitely see that. Of course, we want to make sure that we're not. If you're listening to this and you're getting the text, he doesn't mean while you're driving, right? We're, we're talking about <laughs> after you're sitting down after the day, then you want to read your text, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> No, uh, we, we want to make sure that, that John is absolved from any liability <laughs> from anyone who might have uh, taken that wrong. But, uh, but right. certainly make sure that you are not driving when you read the text portions of his discipleship place content. Yeah. Uh, and let me let me just say, let, can I can I give an example of this? If people yeah, sure. Want yeah. to, so, if, so if people ever wanted to just experiment and see what this is like, if you got your phone, you can just take it right now. And open up a brand new text and then text the word disciple to 55498. And that would give people the course on how to study the Bible. It's all audio. Oh, so you'll cool. get originally one text and then every for about a series of seven lessons over a period of time, you'll be getting some text. You can stop it at any time. But once you get the text before you drive, you can just hit play and then take off and drive, but don't don't try to do that while you drive. Yeah, good. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's that's great. I'm glad you I'm glad you clarified that for us because you know you just never know these days. You have to, you know, that, I mean, we do live in a society that that warns you that your coffee is hot and puts <laughs> you know do not eat on a little pellet bags that they put in in pill bottles and, and you know packaging you know it comes from amazon the little bubble packages do not eat and uh, so obviously there's been somebody in the world who wanted to eat that and so they put that warning label on there so let's just make sure we we have that warning that disclaimer on this podcast as well because this is not monetized yet, so you can't get any money out of this podcast if you <laughs> if you happen to do that. But yeah, that, that's fantastic stuff. Talk a little bit. You mentioned your shame course, so talk a little bit about that course. I, I went through that myself, and there's a ton of shame within the church. Take a little serious tone here within the church, where we we kind of use shame to try and change behavior as opposed to, and, and sometimes in holiness traditions, we have equated behavior change with holiness, and that's not what it's about. It's about transformation, where the behavior no longer is, is attractive to you, as opposed to you know, um, 
you know, you just kind of having to do white knuckle and bear through it there. So talk a little bit about that course on shame. I would imagine that interests a lot of people out there. Yeah. So, you know, several years ago, it's probably been about five, six years ago, I lose track of time. I ran across an, an individual by the name of Reverend Roland Hearn. He's in Australia and he was doing his doctoral dissertation on shame and it was an area that God had been speaking to me about, Jeff, for, for quite a while. In fact, struggling with that in my own life and then through a family member that died by suicide in that moment when I got that news, I, I said to God, I'm in. And so I, I meant by that, I'll be in a healing space with people. And so through this connection with Reverend Roland Hearn, we began to really discuss and talk about What would it look like to have a language for a theology of shame? And and over the years, we had a lot of conversations. And so out of that, we we filmed the course and it's a conversation between us. It's really just a primer in this area, but it walks through some of those key things. And it's coming from a biblical theology as we would see it. And one of the things I think, Jeff, is to realize in this framework to define some terms descriptively, I think it would be fair to say that when we talk about shame, we're not just talking about an emotion. Certainly from a theology standpoint, we're talking about a condition, and that condition is the distortion of identity and worth. And so we see that from a movement in Genesis 2 to 3, where they didn't feel shame at their nakedness, and then in Genesis 3, they felt shame at their nakedness. So God created them to be very good, and they were naked and very good. In Genesis chapter 3, they were ashamed of their nakedness, and they hid. And so shame has a voice of not enough. Sounds like not enough language, Mm -hmm. and that's how we hear it. But at its core, it's a distortion of identity and worth away from being the one created in the image of God as the one who is the beloved which is an understanding of who we are as one created by God who is love. And so that's really the essence of understanding a theology of shame from a 50,000 foot view. And then moving from there to say, what does that look like as we move through scripture, which is housed in a shame honor construct? And then we look at the gospel of Jesus Christ, understanding shame, which which is really powerful to me, Jeff, because when we think about the cross, one of the things that we maybe don't always think about is the fact that Jesus died naked. So from Genesis 3 on, anywhere where you see nakedness, it's always something to be ashamed of. The real The real crux of Roman crucifixion was that the punishment would be one of shame because they would obviously administer a lot of physical pain in the process of crucifying someone. But the truth is, the actual punishment was to hang naked, exposed for everybody to gaze and mock at the person hanging, being crucified. And so that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus, in a way of coming right back into Genesis 3, if you can think about it this way, comes inside of our shame and tells us that we are loved through laying down willingly on the cross to come inside our shame. And that's why Hebrews says Jesus scorned the shame of the cross. Jesus shamed shame. So that's that's maybe a little more than I know. I yeah. what this podcast yeah. is no, about, but no, maybe yeah. that, that's a little bit there on on the theology of shame and love. Yeah, well, I mean, that, this podcast is about amplifying the voices of Christian leaders, and so that is that is your space is discipleshipplace dot org, one of the courses that y'all have. So I think it fits well within the content of the podcast here, and doesn't hurt us to tiptoe into the deep end every once in a while. You know, sometimes the kiddie pool gets boring. And so we, we have to go a little deeper every once in a while. One of the things I, I do remember is talking about shame says we are bad mm-hmm. versus, and I can't remember the other term that you use instead of shame, but basically we did something bad. 
Mm-hmm. So what does what's that? Does what was that other word there? Not so. Shame is I am bad versus what I did bad. Guilt. Sin, I guess guilt. 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 There we go. So you know, there's a lot of discussion, and people might land in different places as they begin to discuss. Is certainly in the realm of psychology, and you might hear people say different things. But I think, generally speaking, it's fair to say that guilt and shame are both self-conscious and moral emotions. The difference is exactly what you just delineated there, which is shame at its core, again, being about identity perception, says, I am wrong. And guilt says, I have done something wrong. It's behavior focused. And the difference between those two is significant because Guilt is very healthy. In other words, for me to feel guilty is not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. And guilt, for us to experience guilt, loads on empathy, meaning empathy as perspective taking. So if I do something to you, Jeff, that I think could be harmful or hurtful to you, if I experience guilt and it's loaded on empathy, what I do is I step outside and I step into your shoes, observing my behavior from your perspective. And I can say, hey, Jeff, when I did that, I can imagine that hurt you. Will you forgive me? It leads me back into relational repair when I have a relational rupture. Shame, on the other hand, though, is quite different because what shame does is it actually shuts down empathy and perspective taking. So, so what happens in shame is my preoccupation is as identity and worth is how do you perceive me? That's all I can be preoccupied with. And the reason why it shuts down empathy is for that very reason. I'm worried about how you perceive not my behavior, but me. And so anything that would make me come across as being wrong is going to be deflected. In other words, most typically you're going to see that when someone's experiencing shame, they're not going to own their behavior. They're going to be Mm -hmm. defensive. They'll probably try to find ways to deflect or avoid. It's a, it's a form of hiding, right? And so we have defense mechanisms that all can look different to try to keep you at arm's length because we're afraid of being exposed. Right. And we're afraid if we are exposed in shame, then we won't be loved and accepted. And so it drives a lot of different kinds of aggressive behavior that we might see on a day-to-day basis. Do you want to grow and multiply your church? Perhaps you need help launching a new church or even a Christian ministry like a coffee shop or something else. Do you find yourself struggling just to recruit volunteers week after week? Is your church in need of new life? Maybe you're fresh out of seminary and the organizational leadership called you with an opportunity and you realize that opportunity needs a fresh start. Or perhaps... You're a church planter. You've been going it alone for a while now, and you're exhausted, lonely, and doubting your call. We understand. Church planting, launching a new church, is hard. Missional Leadership Coaching is here to help. Go to missionalleadershipcoaching.com and click on our free offer to get started today. That's missionalleadershipcoaching.com. We look forward to helping you. Yeah, that's good. And then bringing it back to Jesus on the cross, they, they attempted to expose him. But the only thing they exposed was his love as he forgave others from the cross. You know, so yeah. he had he had no guilt of his own. So his only confession that he had to give was, Father, forgive them. And even in that, he didn't give shame. He said, they don't know what they're doing. They, they, they're, they just don't understand. And he, in his godliness and was able to step back from that and say, I love you regardless of what you're doing to me. And I think that's where sometimes we, I mean, I'm just thinking even in my own family, you know, when we're, we're talking to our children and stuff, um, how they, no, I didn't, I didn't eat that cookie. (laughs) And uh, it's like, no, you're, you're not a bad person because you ate a cookie, but, but you did 
do bad because you ate the cookie because that belonged to your brother, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> or it belonged yeah. to your mother, you know, something like that. So simple examples, but but still, in, in our family systems, they get mixed up, and and then they carry those into adulthood, which can lead to all kinds of mental illness and and you know addictions and and things like that. So that's good. And it also reminds me of that I am bad reminds me of the chaplain I had a couple of weeks ago talking about a moral wound versus PTSD, where PTSD is something bad happened to me. A moral wound says that I did something bad that went against my core values. I, sh- I shot a pregnant woman or I killed a person, mm. things like that. So, so those which triggers shame in and of itself, which is why it's so difficult for that moral wound to heal is because they feel like they're unrecoverable. There's, they are bad because they're so ashamed of that. Good. So now I also remember that, that I don't know if you still do this or not, but the, a certified lay training certificate so people can take the courses on there and they get certificates. And then there is a, it's not an ordination, but, but you can become a, a lay pastor in the Church of Nazarene, and you can do that on the discipleship place, right? Yeah, that's right. So the way that works is that is specifically designed for individuals, as you said, who aren't sensing any kind of a call toward full ordination. And so for that individual, what happens is their name is taken by the pastor to the local church board, and then that church board will approve of that individual. And then the pastor upon that will send an application that we have. It's real simple. And we'll send a certificate of lay ministry, which is good for one year. And then every year they'll renew. In the meantime, in good faith of receiving that certificate of lay ministry, the individual will commit to doing two courses a year. And we have six courses on our site that cover basic Bible and theology. And so we require that they do those six. So that would be a two a year, three years worth of courses there. And then as they continue this process and are working with a mentor, which is going to be the pastor or someone the pastor appoints, then they will do other things. And they could do courses that are on our website or they could do something the pastor has worked out for them to do. So as long as they're continuing in that lifelong learning, we're, we're satisfied. And they're doing it under the supervision of the pastor and the local church board. But it's a significant statement to the congregation because what it what it says to the congregation is this individual has entered a covenantal relationship with the church leadership. And the church leadership is saying to the congregation, we are entrusting significant ministry responsibilities to this individual. And so, you know, what that looks like and enables the person to do will vary between church to church, because we here at the Global Ministry Center, where I work, we're not the ones that are technically certifying that person as a lay minister, the church is. And so the church can outline and say, what this means for you to be a certified lay minister looks like being able to, maybe it's fill in when the pastor's gone and preaching. And that's in some cases what happens. Or it's doing some of the more pastoral duties or administrative duties or whatever. But that can all be worked out between the pastor and church board. Good. So it's a lot now of Do you guys still have your app, your discipleshipplace.org app? We do. Yep. We still have the app, and that is available at the Discipleship Place. It's in the Google or iOS stores, the place, Google Play Store. And several of our th- courses that we talked about are actually under the mental health courses in there and others. But, but then churches can actually get a customizable app. This is all through a ministry partnership we have through Back to the Bible. And it takes a lot of their research in their technology that they built for scripture engagement and things like that. And it's loaded into the app, but it's customizable. So if a church wants to get an app, they can. And it's completely customizable. They can have their own menu wow. items, their own look and feel. We can help help any church that wants that to set up an app for themselves if Good. they would like. So 
Now, is that exclusive to the Church of Nazarene, or if anybody's listening has a church, they can do that? Or? Anybody, anybody listening can do that. So, yeah, it's available for anybody. And if you want to see what that's like, kind of the functionality, you can just download the Discipleship Place app, because that's the kind of app you'll have, and you'll be able to experience what kind of options and kind of imagine what that could look like for your church. Yeah, I love that app, because it's basically taking you know the Discipleship Place and all the content on the go with you. And huh. it's easy to access. And like you said, I like the audio when you're driving down the road listening to that, you know, as opposed to a podcast sometimes. I listen to podcasts as well, but but it's just like to change it up, you know. But I've kind of got I've got a bunch of squirrels running around in my brain. And so depending upon what button they hit yeah. depends upon what I want to do. So. <laughs> I understand. But, but anyway. John, it's been great having you today, and just want to thank our listeners, those that downloaded. I found out um, just this past week that we are in the top 17% of all podcasts, wow, not just in religion. So we started this nine months ago just as a as an experiment, and we're coming up on, you'll be episode number 31. So it's really good. And there's other people out there that do the same, similar things. Michael Johnson has a podcast that he does called Michael in the Middle. He does a great job. We've had him on before. I'm all about lifting up other leaders as well. I mean, this is not, this podcast was not born out of a, a need for me to be famous. I think I'm beyond that at 56. I'm, I've, I've given up on being famous and don't do video on this podcast. I may end up doing it, but, but right now, when I first started, I thought people don't need to see this face. This is the face made for radio, not video. So anyway, it was great having you on, but I was, I was just, flabbergasted, just shocked when I heard that because I, I don't spend a lot of money supporting on promoting it or anything like that. I just try to have great guests on and make it about them. And appreciate you being on today, brother. Great work you do over there at discipleshipplace.org. Encourage you folks to you know download the app, go to the platform, use it for a small group use resource, use it for a youth group resource, use it for family devotions, whatever you know, personal devotions, whatever way you want to use it, I encourage you to do that. And then just want to remind folks to go to book.revitalizedtoplant.com. That's my newest book. If you go there, you can get it for $15 instead of $19 that Amazon charges, which is way too much. But I don't get to choose how much to sell it for. But I did get a handful of books at a cheaper price. And so I'm able to sell up to 100 at $15 instead of $19. And I'll even pay the $3 and whatever cents it cost me to send it to you via USPS. That's United States Postal Service. Now, I will have to give you a caveat. When I was growing up, it was rain, hail, sleet, or snow. They're going to deliver your mail. Today, if they've got a hurt big toe, they probably won't deliver your mail. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I will send it and you guys can get it. John, great having you, man. Have a good day, all right? Yeah, absolutely. It was, thanks for letting me be with you. It was a real honor. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Have a good day. You bet. Bye-bye. You can be a co-creator with God by helping to echo our guest voices, share our episodes with friends and family and on your own social media accounts, give us positive five-star reviews. The more positive reviews we have, the more visibility we have and the more voices that are echoed through eternity. We often invite guests who are serving faithfully year after year, often in anonymity in their respective roles and ministries. God sees them and and the reality is, is for a good kingdom leader, that's enough. We do not do what we do for the accolades of humanity. We do it because we're called by God. But I believe that God uses people like you and I to continue those reverberations and echo them throughout eternity. You can partner with God by liking, subscribing, writing a quick, positive five-star review, and again, sharing those voices with friends and family and on your own social media accounts. Those reviews will eventually lead to other guests who have larger platforms that have more listeners who will then in turn listen to the show. And again, it further echoes those voices, which is The whole vision of the Echoes Through Eternity podcast here is to continue echoing those voices that God is echoing through eternity there. So like and subscribe and review us if you would. We'd appreciate that greatly.